very poor in terms of meeting its obligations, uh, fulfilling its commitments. Um, so we, we remain skeptical uh, about their behavior. But there's a difference between Iran and North Korea. It's an important difference. Uh, North, Korea, North Korea's leaders don't seem to mind being isolated. Uh, in fact, they may believe that isolation is the only way their regime can survive. Iran has different priorities. Uh, yes, uh, they want to move their nuclear ambitions forward, but they also want to be seen as a respected member of the international community. They need commerce. They need trade. They need to engage with the world. Uh, we need to demonstrate to them that they can't have their cake and eat it too. They can't have nu their nuclear ambitions and have these good relations uh, with the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, at least take this opportunity to say I agree with everything that Mr. Einhorn said, that they want to be respected. I would strongly suggest that, that as we continue looking at future sanctions, we recognize that as long as the world allows them to have embassies and allows them to hold our embassy hostage, that we are in fact still allowing them to have normalized relationships with virtually every country on earth and then hope that sanctions will work. I for one believe that we need to take another step and a step that is far greater than sanctions uh, bef before we do military, but I certainly believe we need to take another step and I, I would hope that as we continue looking at this program, if we see it fail, uh, that you'll join with me in trying to find additional steps to gr g give pressure against Iran. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And that's the reason why we're having this hearing. <laughs> no question about it. I now yield five minutes to uh, Congresswoman Marcy Capture from the great state of Ohio. In fact, my classmate. <laughs> thank that's you. That's right. That's, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Glad to see you with the gavel. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for appearing. Uh, Mr. Glazer, I just wanted to ask you, to whom do you report at the U.S. Department of Treasury? Who is uh, your superior? My direct superior is Assistant Secretary Cohen, and he in turn reports to Assistant Secretary who? David Cohen. And he David Cohen, what is his title? Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, and he reports to Under Secretary Levy. And he reports to who? Under Secretary Stuart Levy, who is the Under Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Thank you for placing that on the record. Um, let me just state that I believe history will show that since World War II, uh, U.S. relations with Iran have been very counterproductive to our own interests, both in terms of the advancement of democratic ideals uh, across that vast region, uh, along with the lack of promotion of competitive markets for goods. Uh, sadly, so much of that history, I think, will show that oil has been a, a great diversion uh, for this country. I keep thinking to one of the commandments in my own faith, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. My question is, how does one implement sanctions in a manner that supports U.S. democratic ideals and reform across an undemocratic and mercantilist uh, Middle East? Uh, I think one can argue geostrategically the impact of current sanctions actually operates against U.S. long-term interests because what we're seeing is a backfill of uh, con connectivity by us by China, uh, by Russia. Uh, you've admitted in your own testimony, testimony about the United Arab Emirates. Uh, one can look at other countries. Uh, so it must be really frustrating for you to enforce a sieve. Um, I also wanted to just place on the record uh, <clears throat> for uh, history's sake, uh, back in 1953, uh, there, since World War II really, our relations with Iran, ne we never seemed to get it right. Um, there was a coup back in the early 50s, uh, when um, someone by the name of Mohammed Mossadegh was installed, um, uh, well, he had actually taken office earlier in a democratic election. But then in 53, by spontaneous combustion, he was removed, and the Shah of Iran, when we were growing up, became, we remember him as children, became head of that country. Uh, but the reason the other guy was removed is he was actually trying to change, attempting to reform the monopoly control that one company had over the extraction of oil from uh, Iran. That company was called the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, uh, commonly known now as BP. 
BP. So I think it's important for us to remember a little bit of history here. And through the decade of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the Shah's rule became more and more repressive. Um, and um, I can remember the Savak, studying the Savak when I was in college and, and trying to understand what that was all about. Then in 79, some of us lived through the Iranian Revolution and when the Shah was removed and um, uh, U.S. hostages were taken and the American people were just stunned by, and Terry Anderson from my own state, an ABC reporter, uh, was uh, taken in that and ultimately released, thank God. Um, but then, after all that happened, and I remember those hostages were returned on the day Ronald Reagan became president. Remember that? Some of the people here remember that. Uh, then, for the next decade, we enlisted Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein to do some dirty bidding, and uh, there was a terrible war uh, between Iran and Iraq. Millions of people died. and. Um, so, you know, there's a little backdrop to why the Iranians also, looking through whatever lens they're looking through, uh, as they look at us and they look across that region, might feel vulnerable. I'm not defending their government. I don't defend any government in that region. And I certainly don't defend the economic interests that try to exploit all of them. But in thinking about the future, if in fact we are to be a democratic uh, nation, one that also believes in competitive markets. Uh, the, the report from the GAO shows that, uh, well, guess who's got their fingers in the till over there? Hal Burton, that's the largest. Uh, if you look at the amount of uh, money that uh, they get in government contracts, Hal Burton, number 27.1 billion. Well, who's the big investor in Hal Burton? The former vice president of our country, for heaven's sake. And their fingers aren't clean. It seems like the public and private interests get all mixed up here. And then we try to use the, these pitiful sanctions, which look good on paper and look like we're really doing something. But they don't do anything to promote our geostrategic interests. They don't do anything to bring competitive markets. They don't do anything to promote democracy in that part of the world. And I feel sorry for our country. I feel sorry for the road that we're on here because I don't see that it's really hurting Iran in any way, and it's certainly, most importantly, not advancing the cause of democracy. So in terms of two-way trade, uh, my question goes to the future generation. That is a literate country. There were hundreds of thousands of students demonstrating for democracy in that country. And um, there were some um, sanctions that apparently made it very difficult for them to be able to communicate with the West, with others, in their efforts to try to democratize inside that country. And um, my question is, is the administration or has the administration taken action to allow hardware, software, and technology used to access the Internet to be legally exported to Iran? How do we incentivize? future democratic reforms, and many of the literate people in that country that can connect to the rest of the world who are part of the future so they don't stub their toe and kill millions of more people, as the last generation has done for 50 years, in that extremely important but troubled region. What are we doing to promote connectivity between those who love democracy? Uh, thank you, uh, Congress Congresswoman. This, uh, we, we very much support your uh, strong statement of support for human rights uh, in, in Iran, very important to us. It's thank also you. important uh, that civil society in Iran be able to uh, express themselves, uh, that they have uh, free and secure access to the Internet. Um, the the uh, State Department has worked very closely with the uh, Treasury Department uh, to ensure uh, that U.S. sanctions do not prevent access to tools that allow the Iranian people to freely access the Internet. Uh, State um, uh, did a waiver recently that enabled uh, Treasury to publish a general license in the Federal Register in March that authorizes U.S. companies to make uh, mass market personnel personal communications software available inside Iran. Uh, it's very important that they have the tools uh, to communicate with one another. And we're trying to make that possible. Uh, and any adjustments in the sanctions laws that are necessary, we will, we will seek to adopt. 
And, you know, I just wanted to say for the record, finally, Mr. Chairman, I represent many people who have immigrated from that part of the world. And, you know, this Ahmadinejad, they always have him on TV and he goes to the UN and really doesn't do a very good job for his own people. But there are the people that hold the real power in that country are many of the clerics. And it just seems to me that anything we can do to bridge walls is extraordinarily important. I don't share my colleagues' view, many of my colleagues' view, that the answer to everything is military action against any troubled state. But I think that the power of literacy inside that country, unlike Afghanistan, is so important. Anything one can, in, can do to encourage connectivity um, uh, and enhance yeah. those individuals within that country that are trying to meet the rest of the world in a peaceful way is worth the effort. Right. And uh, I would hope you would think hard about that in the important roles that you um, that you have, and also on the, the oil side to promote has competitiveness. Long Thank expired. you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, okay. I now recognize, <laughs> I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Davis. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, let me thank you for calling the hearing, um, Mr. Einhorn. Let me ask you: um, How does the State Department? measure success in terms of what would be a successful implementation of sanctions against Iran? Could, could you share that with us? I mean, ultimately, the measure of success is whether Iran changes its behavior. Um, that's what we're looking for. Uh, but uh, intermediate steps involve putting uh, serious economic pressure on Iran so that it uh, recomputes uh, its calculation of costs and benefits and realizes that the future is going to look bleaker and bleaker unless it uh, alters its behavior and stops its defiance of the international community. That's what we're looking for. So one could reasonably say that the purpose of sanctions is to change behavior exactly of whoever it is that, that's being sanctioned let me ask are there any items that are not covered in terms of I mean what 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 are we trying to prevent uh, Iran from doing uh, the, the combination of the law the Congress recently gave to us um, uh, as well as the uh, recent Security Council resolution, as well as our own executive authorities. The combination of all those tools, I think, give us what we need to pursue an effective uh, s uh, strategy of pressure against uh, Iran. Are there any items that we would say it's quite all right if we were to interact with those items getting into the country? There are many items. Uh, for humanitarian purposes, uh, to deal with medical problems, there are all kinds of items that are uh, legitimate. Uh, we're not trying to uh, interrupt legitimate trade, certainly not trade having to do with humanitarian, uh, civilian kinds of uh, uses. Uh, but we're primarily going after their programs to acquire weapons of mass destruction, advanced conventional weapons, and other sensitive items. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not interested in a total embargo of Iran. That's not what we're trying to do. So we, there, there is a humanitarian component to the sanctions, especially as it relates to medicine, or medical technology, or life-saving uh, instruments, or advances that may have been made in one country that have not necessarily been made in another country. We're saying that it's quite all right. That's right. We don't intend to block Iran's access to those. Um, let me ask, and if each one of you perhaps would uh, address this question. Our government has awarded more than $107 billion in contract payments, grants, and other benefits over the past decade 
to foreign and multinational American companies while they were doing business in Iran. Is there any way that one could suggest that this is somewhat uh, conflict in, in terms of the overall purpose of sanctions to try and change the behavior of another nation? I mean, th this, um, uh, this development, uh, these uh, interactions uh, were what led to an important provision uh, of the new uh, comprehensive sanctions law. I think it was Mr. Newrider who, who spoke to that um, and can describe to you what's involved. But the idea is to avoid um, uh, uh, such um, uh, contractual arrangements uh, between the uh, United States government and these other entities that have dealings uh, with Iran, especially uh, dealings uh, that are sanctioned under our law. Mr. Davis, if I could add to that, that connection is changing behavior. Um, and I'll give you the best example. Repsol, which is a Spanish conglomerate, had, based on our report, over $343 million in contracts with the U.S. government. Um, they also were investors in Iran's energy sector. They have since made the decision this week to pull out of this $10 billion um, South Pars project uh, and no longer invest in Iran. So we would agree, though, that, that this whole business of sanctions does have a level of complexity that sometimes the, the average citizen, unless they take a good look, may not fully understand what has taken place in relationship to them and what they've actually accomplished and what they have actually met. Absolutely. And I would also note that one of other decision that Repsol make was the divestment clauses in the new act. They were concerned about uh, shareholders divesting in their firm as one of the reasons why they pull out of the South Pars project. Thank you very much. And that, too, is one of the reasons, Mr. Chairman, that I appreciate your call in this hearing to try and bring as much clarity to actions that are taken so that the only way we experience this democracy that uh, my representative friend from Ohio, uh, Ms. Captive, was talking about is that people be able to understand what it is that their government is doing, what it is that the government is trying to do, and what the intents are. So I thank you again for the hearing. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much for your um, participation as well. I now yield to the gentleman from uh, California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just uh, to wrap up a little bit, Mr. Christoph, in the, uh, in the committee's report, I, I hopefully you've looked at it, uh, Ms. Kaptur uh, really sort of talked to this point when she said Halliburton $27.1 billion. Uh, first of all, just for the record, my understanding is the Vice President, when he uh, became Vice President, relinquished all stock in the company, uh, most of which, all of which was not by purchase but by uh, having been an executive there, uh, and is not an investor. But notwithstanding her not understanding what an investor is, perhaps, uh, Halliburton's $27.1 billion, that's how much they got for servicing the needs of the U.S. government. Do you know what they received, some subsidiary of Halliburton received for participation with Iran during that same period of time? I don't know those details, sir. So actually, how much money somebody got from the U.S. isn't particularly important at all. It, what's important is how important was Iran to these, these subsidiaries. And if I understand correctly, under prior law, a subsidiary, wholly owned, not wholly owned, joint venture, controlled, uncontrolled. To be honest, they were allowed to do this. So everything, everything that's here about these companies prior to just a short period ago, they were doing things that were perfectly routine, legal, and not prohibited by executive order or any other law. The new act does change that. Uh, subsidiaries are now affected, but previously they were not. So back to the sanctions, and I, I've been very tough on uh, Mr. Einhorn, uh, but I, I want to go to you based on past performance. Compliance with the past laws by companies seems to be reasonably good. 
and the, the past service and sales and how everyone was circumventing, they were simply complying with the law and using, meeting their responsibility to their, their stockholders. We've ch haven't we, with the last sanction regime, changed the message to them relative to the best interests of their stockholders? You've definitely changed the message, I think, particularly with the divestment clauses, because they are hearing opportunities for shareholders to speak with their voices and pull out of those companies that continue to invest in Iran. Well, Mr. Glazer, I'm going to close with just a question to you. The U.S financial system is a relatively open system. Uh, the chairman and I might disagree on whether or not, or no, we might agree, but disagree with Treasury on whether or not we've given you all the tools of transparency that we'd like you to have in the way of databases and, and so on. But the U.S. companies, companies with a presence and a reporting in the U.S., wouldn't it be fair to say that you get good transparency on them, and if they continue directly or indirectly to trade with Iran, you will be able to detect that and thus sanction them? In other words, you have those tools. Yeah, yes, I, I think that we okay. know what's going on. Would you, in closing for me, our partners in Europe on this measure who have promised to do the same thing, do they have the same tools? And that's the final question, if you answer that they do, is are they going to use them as aggressively as you will? Look, I, I think I've, I've, been, I've been at this for a few, for a few years now. Uh, I think Europe's come, I really do think That's why you get to be here before <laughs> us. We ask no, for it's, experts. And it's, 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 it's an honor. I, 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 I think Europe has come a long way. Uh, and I, again, I was, I've, this has been a very surprising six, six weeks. Uh, the UN went farther than I personally thought they would. You, the EU went considerably farther than I would have predicted if you had asked me three months ago, how far will the EU go? I, I, think there, I think, in all sincerity, I think there is a real growing um, international consensus that something needs to be done and that, and that countries need to take responsibility. Does that mean we're always, we're not going to have issues to work out with particular European countries? I was talking to Mr. Van Hollen about, about one of those. There's going to continue to be issues. Uh, but uh, I do think Europe is serious about this, and I think they've been uh, a, a good partner. Thank you. Mr. Einhorn, the last word goes to you, as long as you include in it uh, letting us know how our former colleague, Ms. Tauscher, is doing. Uh, I, I think, look, you, you know uh, Ellen Tauscher. She's got a lot of spirit, a lot of fight, a lot of grit. Um, uh, you know, she's going to have some, a rough patch, but she's going to come out of it fine. And I'll, I'll send to her your best wishes. Thank you very much. Please sure. do. Thank you. Yield Please back. associate me with that as well. Um, let me um, just close uh, uh, with uh, you, Mr. Glazer, and I guess Mr. Einhorn both. Um, first of all, GAO uh, has identified 41 foreign firms with commercial activity in Iran. Do you agree with that? 41, the number? Uh, th this is really something that is outside of, of the Treasury Department's jurisdiction. We, we target with our particular authorities uh, entities that are engaged in um, illicit activity, be it proliferation or or uh, or, 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 or or terrorism, uh, we we don't keep track of the Treasury Department is not keeping track of foreign companies that are doing business in Iran as a, as a broad matter. That would be for the Commerce Department or others. Mr. Einhorn, you agree with the numbers? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that, Mr. Chairman? You know, GAO has identified 41 foreign firms with commercial activity in Iran's energy sector. Do you, um, do you, first of all, do you agree with the number? We examined all of those cases um, uh, very carefully. And as I mentioned before, we winnowed that number down to less than 10. Uh, these are a number of uh, uh, entities that are very problematic. Uh, I have to say that uh, a, a number of them uh, have been engaged in sanctionable activity. Uh, but as I also said before, we're, we're reaching the conclusion of this process. It's out for interagency uh, views, uh, and Secretary Clinton will make her uh, decisions on this in, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a short period ahead. Yeah. What can you do about these companies, even the 10 that you uh, uh 
Well, it's important to recognize that a number of the entities in this small list uh, have already stopped uh, or are in the process of stopping uh, their engagement uh, in Iran's petroleum sector. So I think what we found is the law is working. Uh, it, the, the, the threat of penalties has encouraged these countries um, to, uh, uh, to get out of the business of, of dealing with Iran. So, uh, so it's, it's quite effective. Yeah. Let me just close by, is there anything more that we need to do on this side of the aisle in terms of from a legislative standpoint in order to make this effective? Uh, I, I think you've just given us a big and important tool to, to tackle this threat. Uh, and you did that only less than four weeks ago. Uh, we have to work uh, uh, hard within the administration to figure out how best to implement this law uh, to maximum uh, effect. So for the time being, we have nothing else to request of you. I, I agree with Mr. Einhorn. I, I think it, you've just passed a very important new piece of legislation. We're in the process of implementing that, uh, and I think it's going to be a, a have a powerful impact. Mm. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we're proceeding to implement the rule required by the Act, and we will do so. I would encourage vigorous and continuous oversight on the part of the Congress to ensure not just that the old sanctions are being enforced, which many had not been, but the host of new sanctions that are on the plates of the executive branch. Right. Thank you very, very much for actually, um, uh, I'd be delighted to yield. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really would like to ask uh, Mr. Nuregatter and Mr. Christoph um, something that has come up throughout this hearing, and that is the report that throughout the last decade, GSA spent roughly $170 billion of taxpayers' money contracting with 74 companies doing business in Iran. At the exact same time, we were trying to put pressure on Iran. And my question is basically, how did this happen? Uh, did the fact that these companies uh, were doing business with Iran ever come up when you were reviewing the contracts uh, or signing contracts in, in uh, GSA? Uh, did anyone from anywhere in the federal government to uh, point out that we shouldn't be giving part of our federal procurement to, to companies that were really in direct violation of our stated foreign policy goals. Um, did anyone ever talk to you, uh, Mr. Nuringarter, or about these contracts and that they should not be getting uh, $170 billion in, in, in taxpayer money when we're trying to impose sanctions? The short answer is no, I have not been involved in, in these matters. Uh, I will be happy to look into this and get back to you for the record. Uh, I returned to GSA uh, two years ago as the director of the Office of Acquis Acquisition Integrity with my duties as suspension and debarment official. But uh, before that I was at HUD uh, as the senior procurement executive and was not aware of any such matters uh, at HUD. But I will be happy to look further into this. Uh, if, if you could and get back to us, Mr. Christoph, do you want to comment on it? Uh, how did this happen that we're handing out billions in federal contracts to companies in direct violation of our stated uh, policy goals, foreign policy, and stated uh, laws of the country? Well, first I would state, state that it is, as we all know, it's the responsibility of the executive branch to investigate companies, determine what is credible evidence, and try to impose the sanctions. The number that I think you're referring to is the New York Times article. Uh, where there was over $100 billion in uh, contracts. When I looked at the, their list, many of those companies are companies that would not be sanctionable under what was then the laws of the land. Uh, companies that were in the automobile industry, for example. Would, would they be sanctionable now under this law? Not necessarily. Why not? Because it still doesn't cover items such as the automobile industry. And there was a lot of companies on that list that dealt in the automotive community. Well, maybe we should cover them with sanctions. Um, I, I just want to mention, uh, Mr. Glazer, that the Treasury Department has done a, a very good job, Sub Rosa, and uh, I, I compliment you on the work you've done. As a member of Financial Services Committee, my, my time is up and we don't have time to go further. We have another panel, but I have a series of questions uh, respectfully I'd like to uh, place in writing to you so that uh, we can get these answers. And, and I uh, congratulate you that, on your work. And that objection is so ordered. 
also the State Department for your international work to get compliance. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now uh, this committee, this actually, uh, let me just say to the members that uh, we, within a few minutes, we will have two votes on the floor. So what I would uh, like to do is to adjourn until 1.30, and we will, will reconvene at 1.30. I'm sorry about that, but we have to vote around here. And if we don't vote, they talk about us. So, um, <laughs> so this panel is actually dismissed. And the committee will adjourn until 1.30, and we will come back.